Welcome, guys, to the finale of Recessional of the Red Dragons. Previously, the Red Dragon Hunters have actually made it up Olympus Mons into the Imperial base, in which Zero and Zorark managed to escape from the advancing armies and invade the place. While there, they also encountered Julia in a lifeless corpse. And Zero actually analyzed the ritual, however, they needed a blood source, and they were actually trapped inside by advancing red dragons. Meanwhile, Jet and the others were attacked by Kim Yakushimo himself. And, thanks to a dastardly Mr. Abel Dil Dilly, he actually shot him in the head, spearing Jet and Spike. So, Will the war actually be turning in our hero's favor? Let's find out. Alright, Chapter 11, Peace's Price. The Red Dragon's war wasn't turning in the Special Forces' favor despite the death of the Crime Syndicate's fallen leader and the infiltration. Both Zero and Zoroark were bearing the exit as a new wave of agents were attempting to break through while the infantry outside were retreating from the heavy onslaughts. Little did the small army knew was that the dark and the light stones were illuminating as brightly as Sirius within Lizzie and Beth's pockets. The lines of defense were falling from the dragon's destructive artillery. The landscape wasn't helping them in terms of cover nor room for advancement. Several dragons were aiming their machine guns at the helpless fleet. Hold position! We got movement, coming fast, closing in by about 300 feet. Looked down at his indicator and saw two massive beasts rapidly descending. Out from the clouds, Zekrom and Reshram finally made it from Earth at the Dragon Spiral Tower. Enforcements arrived, unleashing their wild fury at the Red Dragons, mostly their lethal Yakuza. Using their fangs, tossing them off the rigid cliffs, or their own weight to crush them, they weren't a force to be reckoned with, neither when they were utilizing their intense flames or lethal electricity. The rough exteriors were proven to be futile against their fatal bullets and grenades. They, the hunters, and the reploids fought with it whatever they could. The strenuous atmosphere and the constant chilling winds kept holding them back, though. Other assassins had managed to reach the base and started to break into the tower. Zero and Zoroark were helplessly trapped, trying their best to defend the incap incapacitated Julia with their lives. Their strength was dwindling, and they braced for the worst. The agent broke his disguise and discarded the reflective shades. Zero drew out his Z-saber while loading his Z-buster. Brace yourself, Zoroark! We must save Julia! The aliens temporarily stopped when they noticed the roof beginning to collapse. A chunk fell at a distant corridor and some leftover dust rained onto their precious spiffy tuxes. All of a sudden they were flattened in an avalanche made out of very large pieces of ice. The tower was unprotected despite being underneath a small alcove. They noticed the silence and the maverick hunter struggled to open the door against the enormous crystal-like shard. Zoroark, hold open the door! I'll try and cover our way out of this! Using the saber, he downloaded the neon orange fire saber again, which worked wonders on the damage left by the enormous ice. Melted like magic, revealing the bone-crushed members beneath. They couldn't stand the demolition, though they rightfully deserved it. Zero told Zoroark to carry Julia's still body out, though they were greatly worried if they should be immersed into the battlefield once more. Their special forces were depleting on all supplies and ammo due to the advancing syndicate, with the arrival of Reshram and Zekrom, even still, victory looked very bleak from here. Suddenly, the tower briefly shook, as if an earthquake hit it. Zero suspected it was due to the Pokemon using the move like Aurorus, or the two Saucebucks, but it wasn't what he thought when even more chunks of the so-called indestructible mountain collapsed onto the tower itself. It was even enough to break through the entire roof, and dim the lights, making the rooms barely seeable. We're gonna get buried up here! Grunt Zorak and pulled him and Julia as they ran for their hides. 
Move, Sora Mark! Hurry! Two legendary dragons knew at this rate of their trainers nor their allies would survive another large attack. Their only chance was to wipe out every last surviving member of the Syndicate, both from above and below the fleet. Zekrom took the bulk while Reshram alternated from eating its partner, as well as melting the shielded ice making the summit of Olympus Mons collapse onto their enemies. It was also more deadly as the fire types who were still able to fight added on to the heat left by the vast white dragon. Both Reshram and Zekrom had the method to utilize the treacherous environment to their advantage. Reshram used its most potent flaming abilities, yet to mop the floor with its enemies while also causing the once unconquerable mountain to collapse. It, along with the constant onslaughts from both sides, wasn't enough for the highest peak in the universe to handle. Briefly, battle screeched to a halt as everyone saw debris and particles of dust and ice rain down on them. Oh no! Run! The trainers immediately withdrew each of their active Pokémon, but they didn't have time nor patience to call back their mighty dragons. Zero dashed away as fast as possible. Dora created the illusion of another Rapidash to increase its speed, while still carrying Julia's limp body. In the nick of time, they made it out, but they still had a ways to go as they quickly descended the uneven, disturbed trail. The remaining fully functional Reploids carried the humans away and made the escape faster, although they needed to keep their footing from the slippery terrain. Victoria soared over the demise as she saw the massive clouds of melted ice and thick dust blanketing the slope. She lowered the carrier with zeros cowering in fear, and managed to punch a button that opened a hatch from the side. She spoke from the loudspeaker over the ruckus. Guys! Enter the open hatch of my truck! Get inside now! Run for cover! You can't stay here! Get out of here! Everyone obliged as they barely heard Victoria's pleas over the roars of the mountain's demise. They ran and leapt as far as they could, with the Reploids coming in first. The deck shook as each of them landed harshly on the ramp. There was X who loaded the dock, but just as he was about to steal the open latch, he heard Christ relaying as it was his partner Zero. He looked back and saw a fiery figure rapidly descend the peak as fast as the eye could see. The seed wearing the sneering eyes and green irises left with Julia slipping from its back. Zero lurched as he caught her in his arms while he made a humongous jump. For a few moments, he glanced at her grace which caused his mind to shift back to Iris again. Then he noticed he was just a few feet short. He outstretched an arm, though X, using his quick reflexes, caught him. The landing caused the truck to tilt over as the Maverick Hunters held on for dear life. They were eventually able to pull each other up thanks to some helping hands from Reploids and humans. But there was still something that was amiss. Everyone was accounted for except the two legendary dragons. Reshram stopped its rage, realizing its trainer wasn't going to make it out alive. The truck was moving at a snail's pace from all the weight of what was left of the special forces, including the masses of the Reploids X and Zero. The added weight caused the truck to become vulnerable to oncoming debris, which hit it on contact, driving it down from just a few miles up. The white shield volcano was too much for the liftoff. Everyone hang- everybody hang on! All hands brace for impact! Sudden demise had dam damaged Victoria's truck, forcing it to shut down, nearly kill her in the process. Rough ripplings covered the unfortunate humans and Pokemon who were exposed, while Reshram was holding back the avalanche as much as it could. Its mistress Lizzie begged it to escape with them. Same thing with Beth and her Zekrom. As if speaking telepathically, he said they must go without them. But this was the only way. Despite their promises for victory and survival, Beth and Lizzie kept imploring them to leave. X recovered and kept starting Vicky's truck. Fortunately, the vehicle left by the impact was non functional. So Zekrom left down the trail and charged the engines using its awesome turbines. turbines from its tail, giving it a powerful boost. The astronomical weight was too strong for Reshram alone. Zekrom too was caught in the crossfire, but letting Beth as well as her compatriots escape with their lives. 
ferocity used more than they could handle. With a few stowaways left by the lucky few reploids and a lifeless Julia, they were able to survive and leave the devastating peak, with the two legendary dragons sacrificing themselves to they stayed behind, near the summit. The helm went active again and X ascended the truck while the dragons kept holding the crumbling ice and dust, smiling at the warriors they proudly served. While the two perished, the stones lost their luster. Both Lizzie and Beth began to sob for the sacrifices they'd made, as well as angrily accepting their refusal to be called back to them. X cried out as he looked over and saw Victoria impaled by a fallen metal spike coming out from the middle of her chest. With an enormous open gash left by the crash landing, X Hero, the Reploids, Trudy, and Faye witnessed Victoria dying afterward, while the trainers confronted their distraught cousins. Uh, zero, everyone. You shouldn't talk. She was she as well as others had to constantly look away from that gruesome open wound. They were even thankful that her cat wasn't here to see it. Zero. Hex. <laughs> you must do this. Give her my blood. Her spike. Her Julia. Her voice was nearly audible when she explained that she was a type O, much like Spike and Vicious. Hurry. He needs this. To be happy. Reunited with his beloved. I would wish for the same thing with you all. Still not, still not quite unnerved by Vicky's condition, Zero applied the last intact syringe she managed to find before he and Zorro got trapped during the ambush. Like a dedicated surgeon, he drew in some of her blood flowing from the gash. Hey, please look after my only companion, Zero's. He truly needs a friend. Please, let Spike and Julia be able to lead a happy, peaceful life together. The war should be won now. May my spirit fly among the stars. You're all. She was able to make a smile thanking her newfound friends before she gave her last breath and closed her eyes. Everyone, including the Reploids, were mourning for all the sacrifices they had endured over these past several hellish days. As far back as when the dreadful nightmare first began. Was this truly the end? Spike's eyes went into rapid eye movement. Lids looked as if they were fluttering around a hundred miles a second. The guys and Edward gave Jet whatever medical supplies they can get their hands on whether it be some ice packs or a couple of extra strength pain relievers. Though the retired officer exerted himself trying to awaken him, but he wouldn't budge. It was as if he was having a very horrifying nightmare, just waiting to consume him. Ein at times lit their faces as a constant reassurance for their pain and suffering, never leaving their side. The gang hardly noticed the landing of the Red Tail space shuttle or Vicky's truck. They all abruptly looked up as they heard the handle jiggle, and in popped Trudy, Faye, X, Zero, and Mary, all wearing grim expressions on their faces. Oh, guys, you're back! Chet was very astonished upon their return, as well as their condition seeing the filth cuts and bruises. Oh, did you guys win? Was it the Red Dragons? I actually killed their leader, Kim Yakushimo. Jet told me all about him, and they had a struggle. I was lucky I was able to use his gun and make a clear shot. Did you win? Are the baddies gone? Whoa, Edward. I, I think we should turn on the television to find out. Everyone did just that. Sure enough, there was a news break. The mail announcer was briefing over the destruction of Olympus Mons. Jet and the others were stunned at the sight of it. Mary explained it was actually the trainer's fire types, Reploid scorching skills, as well as Reshrim, who showed up as a reinforcement. She went on that Zekrom, it, and Victoria died for their cause, among several casualties from the ISSP and Reploids. As soon as the young host mentioned the Red Dragons have surrendered, 
Everyone cheered. The surviving officers with the assistance done by the Reploids had caused them to falter. He mentioned that with every agent captured, all veterans that participated should receive a hefty bounty. Unfortunately, the joy was only short-lived, as they discussed about those they had lost, even the Bebop. Despite the hurrah from the outside, Spike was still in a comatose state, or rather a dream state, in between life and death, or ordering order and chaos. While in limbo, he actually wound up in a desolate, dark area. Spike it caused him to stir, barely opening his eyes as he saw bright light linger over him. Through the glare and his blurry vision, he thought he saw double, though he later recognized it was only Shin and Lin. Spike, it's us, Shin and Lin. We need to rise up, Spike. The war has been won. You're a free man now. Spike barely moved a muscle felt his body was being weighed down by an animal, or if he was just paralyzed by all the physical torment. Er, Lin, Shin, I can't move. I don't have the strength. He heard and saw other spirits, including Annie, the twins, Rocco, even his late mentor. Spike, my boy. You've gone a long way since you became a member of the Syndicate. You becoming a bounty hunter and a renowned anti-hero trying to reunite and live peacefully with Julia. You found her. Your friends are reviving her as we speak. You'll be together yet. Your blood ties with Vicious has been permanently cut. She is right, Spike. My son. This shot up when he heard Mao in the heavens. Still, he didn't have the vigor to get up. You must get up. Julia awaits you. The red dragons have been captured and slewed. I can finally rest now since Vicious nor Yakushimo can no longer influence the syndicate. The van may have been murdered as well. I saw them die by the corruption Vicious laid. But I knew since then that she will lead them. It's even better since they are gone. And only you and Julia could be our budding legacy. That? Julia? Yeah, Jet. I met her once when I saved her that one time. And she knew Spike. Oh, oh, I hope we're not too late. Edward caught her fingers crossed as tightly as possible. Zero and X laid her down in an unfolded green cup beside Spike. The red bot inserted the syringe into the back of Julia's neck. He then leaned over and whispered in her left ear the same incantation as Cam and his foot soldiers used. Gradually, life started to return. Her cheeks were glowing. Her cheeks were growing red. Her skin was returning to its light peach pinkish hue. Her heart began to pump blood. Her breathing started shallowly. Julia? Julia? Spike needs you. Wake up! Eventually, she did just that. Her eyes opened very slowly as she moaned. Her head constantly moved. Her mind barely registered that she was even alive. Her vision cleared and she saw zero of the others. Who... Who are you? Don't you remember me, Julia? I saved your life while the red dragons were chasing you. You seem to know Spike. You wanted some bounty hunters to look after you. Well, so are we. She showed and introduced her to the group, though Edward had to be sent away for a while by McIntyre to keep the silence. Zero stated of Victoria's fate and that she was willing to donate her blood to Julia, reviving her and reuniting with Spike, instead of turning into a puppet hell-bent on war and chaos. Though I used the black magic incantation, I actually deleted it from my internal memory banks. Why? Why did you do that? I was awakened by Dr. Wiley and infected with the Maverick virus, so I barely knew a thing or two about using a very sinister spell to resurrect someone. Besides, it's the only way to end this nightmare. Maybe his. 
It's an insecurity about the madman who destroyed the Bebop and nearly slew his former friends. He also recently discovered that he too used to be one of the top assassins. No different than himself. He was truly on the fence as to whether or not he should spare him. Julia glanced over. Spike! She nearly went over to him, startling the onlookers. Spike? Spike! You could hear me. Come back. To me. To us. I, I love you, Spike. That's all that matters. It's all a bad dream, Spike. Come out of it. End it now. Caused her voice to crack under the desperation. <sighs> Julia's right. <clears throat> Julia's right. Spike's soul would never find any rest nor peace. He'll only know the influence of Vicious's blood within him. Then the nightmare will begin again. Julia, only you can do this. Let it end. Tonight. She looked toward her loved one again. It's all. Still a dream, Spike. Just a dream. She leaned in, kissed him passionately on the lips, then on his forehead. Soon enough, Spike began to take in deep breaths. She watched him very closely as she readjusted his hands, attempting to rest them on his rising and falling chest. She laid a hand on top of him and caressed them gently, even his left cheek. Guys, we need to hurry. The Reploids are leaving. Oh, hi, Julia. On my way. I followed X and they all followed them out. But they hesitated. I gave them one last lick as a final goodbye to both lovebirds. Julia, are you coming with us? I prefer to stay with Spike, if you all don't mind. She nodded and... <clears throat> she nodded headed out with the others. The sky was very dark red, fading into black. X was bidding it zero farewell. So where are you girls heading? Home? The war is finally over. Our friends and families must be very worried about us, especially since none of us expected to land on Mars and fight an intergalactic conflict. Yeah, I guess we'll all miss you. Yeah, I guess. We'll miss all of you. You guys did wonderful back there. We never would have won this fight without you. Nor would we without Reshram, Sekrom, and Victoria. We should also pay our respects and honor them. Edward gave Trudy a giant affectionate bear hug, repeating on how much she'd miss her. Trudy later gave Ayn a joyful belly rub. She would definitely miss them dearly. She hoped Edward and her parental guardians would call her and jet any time they wish. The rest of them wished them a safe journey back. Jet advised them to use the hyperspace gates like the last time they entered here. They couldn't have been more prouder. However, someone decided to stay. As the truck started its ignition and eventually lifted off through the thin atmosphere, Trudy noticed Zero looking up, watching X wave goodbye through the driver's seat window. To his new friends below. He saluted him and waved back. Zero! Face to learn the same confident expression. You've chosen to stay on Mars? Why? Well, you know, I've decided to take a break from living on Earth for a while. Sigma's gone. Red Dragon Syndicate has been thwarted and Kim is no more. Besides, becoming a bounty hunter than a maverick hunter is not a bad idea. This could be a great opportunity for me, meeting other life forms, exploring other worlds. And X I are, and I are finding peace at last. Let's hope Spike would do the same. We hope so too, Zero. Glad you decided to stay with us and hang out. Meanwhile, Julia watched the long truck ascend and soar away from Tharsis. She will never forget the time when she was able to receive another bill of light. Looked down, watching her beloved. Julia. 
she lifted his head with her hand going behind his neck, lifting him to kiss her. She knew he wanted this for a long time. In that moment of bliss, he knew this was all too real to be considered another dream, and he couldn't be any happier. Both he and Julia grinned as they looked deeply into their eyes, despite Spike having an artificial one. It was as if time stood still when they warmed up toward each other. They kissed deeply like there was no tomorrow. Thank goodness no one else witnessed their soulful reunion. Unintended. Their sacrifices was another scenario came up with five years back. They utilized the mountain's destruction as a way to kill off the remaining red dragons, in order to help their comrades seize victory. I'm sure that Kira and their icy counterpart will find another incarnate of the two dragons somewhere and be reborn. They're three parts of one whole, no doubt. After all, it's a war fix, so there has to be some casualties. As for Vicky, I never wanted her to go, but I did want her to provide Julia another chance to live without the fears of being hunted down, then assassinated by Vicious and his thugs. I was so disheartened when Spike lost her before his own demise. So let's hope Zero's method could work properly on her, and not let her turn into a violent rageaholic who's only a tool for killing and destruction. And there are the songs for that. Please keep in mind that as for an anime couple, I'd much rather prefer Spike and Julia than Spike and Faye. Sure, they have some things in common, are skilled bounty hunters and have a dark past, but I'd much rather prefer Spike and Julia to have a better life. Besides, he hated her since he labeled her as a woman with an attitude. It's not that I hate Faye, it's only because she was my least favorite. Still, losing both Julia and Spike was heart-wrenching. Especially, it's all during the finale. Weight is still heavy to carry to this day. They were not kidding. So why not take advantage of the dark arts that were used from the very start? I can never be sure about Faye and Jet, though. And finally, the epilogue. Blue suede skies. Six weeks later, Tharsis had finally healed its numerous deep and tragic scars from the Red Dragon War. Everyone honored those that had sacrificed their lives for intergalactic freedom, especially those that paid tribute to Victoria, Reshram, and Zekrom, most of the Reploids, as well as the members of this ISSP. Thanks to the astronomical payout for the surviving veterans, Yano's black market had transformed into an outlet selling more various goods, while still serving some ammunition and weaponry for those who were willing to keep the peace in Tharsis and other planets. Not only that, but a small apartment was built at the top floor housing Spike, Julia, and Trudy. She had her own space while Spike and Julia shared theirs, just like the old days when he was taken in after he was wounded during the fatal war against the White Tigers. The Would They Won't They couple gave Trudy the honors for reviving and reuniting them in exchange for no longer living in the slums, nor inside a worn-down spaceship. Young Space Cowgirl was so thrilled by their offer. They also had some new private quarters, as one of the ISSP officers had perished. She gladly took over residence in one of the apartments in Uptown Tharsis. She also decided to care for Victoria's feline, Zeros. After a while, he grew accustomed to his new owner and lived a healthier life than when he was devastated over his previous owner's loss and refused to eat or move. They now had a comfortable new place to call home instead of just dreading it being destroyed by oncoming meteors. After several weeks of renovation, the former Red Dragon's hideout had been bulldozed, then rebuilt to half its size. Both Jet and Zero wanted to live together at the revamped skyscraper, which would actually function as a sort of home base for the spanking new bounty hunting team. Although Zero still wasn't used to fighting humans, he has been an extraordinary assistant to the Black Dog in terms of engineering and technology. For Mary and her cousins, they resumed normal lives as if little to nothing has happened. That is, except when they mourned their fallen titans, Reshram and Zekrom. The dark and light stones were still opaque and dormant, and the texture even had some weak particles here and there, like loose dirt. Both girls put away these stones and actually prayed for the Pokemon to return and get resurrected since their ice counterpart, Kyurem, is still around. 
As for X, he had the opportunity to achieve his wish in witnessing peace and tranquility for the first time in his life. Sigma and the Red Dragons have been vanquished at last, yet he still performs his duties both as Reploid and Savior for humankind on Earth. Especially when he and his men kept a lookout for any oncoming devastating meteors. He also wishes Zero well in his outpost in Mars. He wishes to visit him and his new friends again one day. Oh, and he has been promoted as the head of the Maverick Hunters during Zero's absence. It turned out that it was Vicious's, or rather Striking Snake's guardian star that fizzled within the night sky instead of Spike's, which was a very good sign since the guardian star never got a chance to fuse, thus his red and Spike's blue one reverted, creating a supernova, and hence Spike was never forever being linked with the volatile blood made by Kim Yakushima. Like a blown-out candle, Vicious's red star was no more and prevented Spike's inevitable fate. Instead, his own star was restored to its natural hue. Though it darkened, symbolizing its next phase as well as its advent life hurdles. For Spike and Julia, they couldn't be any more at ease. It changed him in a way they never thought possible. He was actually cutting back on smoking as he took some gum that helped his nicotine cravings. He reduced his drinking habits while only consuming alcohol on social occasions. He does train Julia and Trudy the same burgers ways his late master now did. However, they were also looking grim. He hadn't been, look he hadn't been like himself since before his so-called demise. He seemed to have been sleeping for many hours a day, even goes into unconsciousness constantly. He seemed to no longer be his flamboyant self. Later got his groove back, but Zero made a diagnostic scan. He is suffering from a concussion. Doc was safe in pr his private hospital was unscathed, though he made the prognosis that Spike developed amnesia as he couldn't remember the incidents, nor the war, and the devastated Dragon's headquarters. He theorized he may be prone to PTSD and even epilepsy, having episodes of grief and consciousness. Gave him a cocktail in which he reluctantly took with Trudy and Julia's ongoing support. Thanks to the victorious war effort, everyone pitched to raise money and fund the long abandoned program Big Shot. There's this new store, there's the arcade TV set, and was playing that banjo with American money. Sure enough, it was indeed Big Shot, and all its fabulous advanced glory. Usual pair greeted the audience with their same old routine. Howdy, amigos! We are back on the air! That's right, Punch! Thanks to a very generous donation from the courageous and valiant Bebop bounty hunters, we're back and better than before, broadcasting brand new bounties from across the galaxy. You're about to take your first lesson on fetching a bounty head, Julia. Shh, quiet, quiet. Before we announce our first catch of the day from the last couple months, I'd like to introduce a new space girl and cowboy to our growing family of over 300,000 hunters. Victoria, Zero. For the announcers, there is Julian Zero, standing proud. Then there was a segment with the logo of the Bebop flashed on the blank screen. Signal went off as Jet appeared. From his control room, he found a brand new bounty head that's worth a few thousand wulongs. So what do you say, guys? You up for it? Trudy spoke. Jet, if you want us bounty hunters, you take all of us bounty hunters. Even the new candidates, Julian Zero. They gathered around her. From now on, every mission we do, we do together. Searching a bounty? That's easy. Keeping a team or a family together? That's difficult. And that is truly our mission that is worth fighting for. She shut off the receiver. A short time later, the sun was shining on the peaceful, bustling streets of Tharsis. Trudy was seen toward, walking toward his comrades. She met up with Zero, and they both watched Julian Spike looking through the windows after an embrace. Before he closed the binds. Ah! She smiled as she looked up, eyes becoming vacant. 
her face blank. Trudy? Trudy? Mars to Trudy. What are you looking at? Watching for meteors? Or any more red dragons? No, Zero. I was just thinking about what the future may hold. I'm very concerned about Spike. It's going to take a while before my fears will vanish. Instead of worrying about his condition, or that I may have another violent tendency again. Also, I've never seen a blue sky so clear and beautiful at Mars before. It's always red because of all the carbon. So, now that the red dragons are gone, and Spike and Julie are one again, I guess the future looks quite bright for all of us. She couldn't agree more. So what now, Space Cowgirl? She couldn't be any more prouder at her new life title as an official cowgirl rather than a space cadet with a wandering mind amongst the heavens. Well, Zero? The sky's the limit! Of course, the story will end like the series. This one, Zero asked what the future would lie for them. Alright, Spike, Julie, and Trudy, all of Mars, and the entire universe are free from Red Dragon's dominion. I've already carried that weight. It has motivated me to write this fic. Now I can finally rest easy that since it's been done after five years in hiatus. Fans don't have to guess about Spike's fate, nor worry for Jet and Faye. It's all over now. I've always wanted to have Big Shot back in the air, let Jet have a new base, and also recruit Julian Zero as new bounty hunters. I want to give some quick shoutouts to Peak Ace as well as Space Cowboy 656, which you would only see on fanfiction, as well as Bionic Slime and Chris Stuckman, which they gave it a lot of praise. And I wish they would actually notice this. Same thing with Idia Noben, who gave me the Mega Man X reviews, as well as The Great Clement. I might develop another story highlighting one of their brand new missions, but I'm not sure yet. And I really wanted to end the doom and gloom on a very positive note addressing the viewers. Because after all, like Trudy said, the sky's the limit.
Everything is clearer now Life is just a dream, you know It's never ending